So this is going to be a continuation of a series that I started last year, which I think is particularly needed right now. And that is going to be on addressing and uh, even reconciling uh, the ambiguities and controversies of the Second Vatican Council. Now, to just reiterate some caveats here from uh, the last video that I did on uh, Dignitatis Humanae, uh, since I got a lot of uh, heat for it, mainly from you know, a set of vacantists, as can be expected. Um, what does it mean to reconcile in this context? Well, I'm not claiming that the documents of Vatican II were expressed in the best way, um, or that there are discrepancies that have to be looked at very seriously, and certainly in some of the documents. Uh, but what I am trying to do here is um, what I think really every Catholic is obliged to do when faced with a magisterial text uh, of the universal uh, ordinary magisterium, and that is to try as best he can to interpret the text in a manner consistent with the church's tradition. I think you do have to give these texts the benefit of the doubt. Uh, it's by no means sufficient to take uh, maybe certain unfortunate connotations or after effects of some passages and use that alone to venture off into certain sects of uh, traditional Catholicism that may become more and more removed from any recognizable union with the living sources of church authority as remaining within the bosom of the living apostolicity of the church. Uh, I think this should be indispensable to retaining essential Catholic identity. So I think it's very pertinent for uh, any Catholic to studiously um, look over these documents and sincerely try as best as they can to uh, reconcile them with the unbroken tradition of the church. Um, now this should not be uh, an alien attitude for a Catholic since we believe divine revelation uh, comes to us through two sources, sacred scripture and sacred tr tradition. And within sacred tradition, while there is indeed an element which is fallible uh, and an element which is fallible, not treat the fallible as if it is simply uh, dispensable or something to be uh, tossed away with uh, at will. Uh, the documents of Vatican II, uh, it must be conceded, of course, do not rise to the level of extraordinary magisterium, and I would never uh, profess that. You know, Paul VI, for example, made it very clear that there is no uh, formula hidden within the long, some would say, uh, needlessly stretched out verbiage of the council texts that would uh, follow Vatican I's uh, protocol for constituting an ex cathedra statement guarded by the charism of infallibility. Now that being said, a non-infallibility is not uh, uh, sufficient for a Catholic to dismiss a magisterial text out of hand. Uh, the Catholic is obliged to uh, submit to its contents unless it can be definitively proved beyond a reasonable doubt that it runs counter to weightier magisterial authority or if it can be definitively proven to be out of harmony with uh, the repeated magisterial teaching of the church present throughout the 2,000 years of her existence. Therefore, the Catholic, it seems to me, owes to the text of Vatican II uh, the benefit of the doubt, and this must be sustained through uh, even the grave personal difficulties with certain uh, ambiguous passages that I would certainly concede exist. Um, so now that all this has been established, uh, the Vatican II document that I want to discuss here is uh, Lumen Gentium, which is a dogmatic constitution concerning the nature of the church herself. Uh, now it's important to point out an immediate caveat, uh, however, concerning the term dogmatic constitution. Just because the word uh, dogmatic is used, it doesn't mean that the document itself is meant to be dogmatically binding in and of itself. Uh, it does, however, pertain to the dogmatic teaching of the Church, which has been magisterially established prior to the writing of this document. Um, this is just to address what some people seem to say about the binding nature of Vatican II, uh, particularly uh, a set of vacantists and some Orthodox. Um, I can't stress enough that nothing in these documents, considered in and of themselves, meet the qualifications of infallible magisterium, and uh, they can only be considered infallible in a derivative sense, insofar as uh, in many 
areas of the documents, they make present what has already been uh, infallibly defined by the church. Uh, my interest in defending, say, uh, some of these controversial elements of Lumen Gentium, uh, it does not stem from a desire to, say, uh, ward off what I would consider an existential threat to the church's indefectibility, because uh, I can concede for the sake of argument, given what we just established, that um, the documents, they may very well contain some errors. Uh, and this is given the non-infallible nature of these conciliar texts. My interest in this video, rather, is in reconciling what can be reconciled so as to minimize as much as possible any kind of doubt in the authentic magisterium of the church, which uh, the Catholic is obliged to uh, minimize to the best of his ability. Um, so with regard to Lumen Gentium in particular, I think there are two main passages that uh, traditionalists seem to take the most issue with, and for understandable reason, by the way. Now, the first of these is going to be found in Lumen Gentium 8, where the council declares, quote, the church constituted and organized in the world as a society subsists in the Catholic Church, which is governed by the successor of Peter and by the bishops in communion with him. Although many elements of sanctification and of truth are found outside of her visible structure, these elements, as gifts belonging to the Church of Christ, are forces impelling toward Catholic unity." Unquote. Now, with this quote, there are two elements that uh, some traditionalists seem to take issue with. Now, the first of these has to do with the word subsists. Uh, their argument is that the Council is implying a real distinction between the Church on the one hand, the Church of Christ on the one hand, and the Catholic Church on the other, which would imply that the Catholic Church and its visible structure merely instantiate the true Church of Christ. And uh, conceivably, the Church of Christ could be instantiated in, say, some other non-Catholic ecclesial sect uh, or structure. Uh, but this, I think, stems from a fundamental misunderstanding of the very meaning of the word subsist, uh, which, if you watch uh, this channel, I'm sure you know, is a term that uh, stems from a scholastic philosophy, Thomistic philosophy, uh, and has a very precise uh, meaning that is easily susceptible to distortion. Now, what it does not mean in this context, or really in any context, uh, in, in scholastic philosophy, certainly, it, it does not mean inherence or instantiation. Uh, in other words, it does not refer to a thing existing in another, and nor does it refer to a thing existing as an instantiation of, say, some broader formality, some broader form. Um, uh, rather, it refers to as uh, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, by the way, has uh, uh, elucidated, uh, it refers to the existence of a thing as a complete, per se, individual. Uh, as Pope Benedict the Sixteenth says, quote, uh, "The Council is trying to tell us that the Church of Christ may be encountered in this world as a concrete agent in the Catholic Church. Uh, this can only happen once, and the view that subsisted." should be multiplied fails to do justice to the particular point intended. Uh, with the term subsisti, the Council is trying to express the particular quality of the Catholic Church and the fact that this quality cannot be multiplied. The Church exists as an active agent uh, within historical reality." Unquote. Thus, the word subsists in this context refers to the fact that the Church of Christ exists in its complete and independent reality. In the Catholic Church, and any elements of the Church's sanctification, and this uh, point uh, touches on the other issue that they take issue with, any elements of the Church's sanctification which may exist outside her visible walls, they only exist insofar as they derive from the Church's complete and total subsistence in the Catholic Church. Hence. When a Protestant, say, is validly uh, baptized, that baptism, uh, while it happens indeed outside the visible walls of the church, nevertheless properly belong to the Catholic Church and is related uh, to her as its source. To deny that there could be elements of sanctification outside of the visible walls of the church is, in fact, uh, 
uh, an error that was condemned long before the Second Vatican Council. Uh, in 1713, Pope Clement XI condemned uh, one of the Jansenistic errors of uh, Pasquier Quancel, uh, which reads, quote, outside the church, no grace is granted, unquote. Uh, but such graces uh, or elements of sanctification are, properly speaking, always the church's possession, which is why the council says that there are uh, that these would constitute forces impelling toward Catholic unity. They impel toward Catholic unity precisely because these elements of sanctification as possessions of the church will always orient the souls that they touch toward the church. It is true that such souls uh, may or may not follow these graces through to the full extent towards which they are ordered, uh, but that they do point toward the church is affirmed by the council itself. So I wouldn't see this passage when read in its proper context as uh, conflicting with Catholic orthodoxy here. So moving on to the other controversial passage from Lumen Gentium, well, uh, we're going to have to take this one in chunks because it's a bit of a lengthy one. Uh, in the first part of it, uh, the council reads, quote, the church recognizes the many ways she is linked with those who, being baptized, are honored with the name Christian. Though they do not profess the faith in its entirety or do not preserve the union of communion with the successor of St. Peter, unquote. Uh, now it goes on to discuss in more detail the elements of truth that uh, Protestantism and Eastern Orthodoxy retain and where they part ways from communion with Rome. Now, it is important to keep in mind uh, what the Council is saying here. Uh, it is not saying that Protestants and Eastern Orthodox constitute members of the Church, even imperfect ones. Uh, that would indeed go against what, for example, St. Robert Bellarmine and St. Cyprian say when they explicitly teach that heresy and schism cut one off uh, entirely from the Church. Um, however, just because someone is not a member of the church, it does not mean by that fact that uh, they are entirely unrelated to the church or that they are altogether estranged from her. Uh, as St. Robert Bellamine says concerning heretics who have departed from the church, quote, they pertain to the church like sheep to the sheepfold uh, when they roam outside the sheepfold. The church can judge concerning those who are inside by that very fact or who ought to be just as a pastor really can judge and compel the sheep who wander outside of the sheepfold um, through the mountains to return to it, unquote. And he further goes on to say, quote, heretics retain those indelible characters outside the church, such as baptism, just as lost sheep uh, retain the branding uh, on their back, and deserters of the military uh, retain uh, the military signs. But they are not in the church for that reason, because those characters do not suffice to constitute someone in the church, unquote. In other words, while they are indeed outside the church formally and an act, uh, which the council does not deny, nevertheless they are still linked to the church, both in potency and by virtue of the indelible character of their baptism. This connects them to the church not as members, but as lost sheep, whose identity as lost sheep necessarily implies a retaining relation to the sheepfold that they have abandoned. Uh, further, drawing on uh, what we have said uh, concerning the earlier passage, insofar as they retain elements of the truth, of, of the truth rather, they are engaging with the church's rightful possession, and for that reason, even while uh, they are severed from the church formally and actually, they nevertheless do retain a relationship to the church from which. Uh, they are severed in various ways, and precisely because of this retaining relationship, uh, this should actually inspire us all the more to call them back into actual membership of the mystical body of Christ. And this is an aspect that we're going to cover later in the video. So, moving on here, the Council further says, quote, Those who have not yet received the gospel are related in various ways to the people of God. In the first place, we must recall the people to whom the testament and the promises were given, and from whom Christ was born according to the flesh, and of course talking about the Jews. Uh, on account of their fathers, the, this people remains most dear to God, for God does not repent of the gifts that he makes or of the calls that he issues." Unquote. 
Now, uh, before we move on to uh, the fact that this discusses the Jews, uh, it is very important, I think, to analyze the first sentence because it is noteworthy that the footnote after it uh, actually cites St. Thomas Aquinas' third part of the Summa. Uh, just to reiterate, the first sentence reads, quote, those who have not yet received the gospel are related in various ways to the people of God, unquote. Uh, we already went over how baptized heretics and schismatics retain some relationship to the church and the unique way uh, in which that holds for them. But how could uh, there be a relationship uh, to the church that would extend even to those who are not baptized? Uh, the fact that it quotes St. Thomas here I think is illuminative in uh, addressing this difficulty. Uh, St. Thomas says, uh, addressing the question as to whether or not Christ can be said to be the head of all men, quote, those who are unbaptized, though not actually in the church, are in the church potentially. And this potency is rooted in two things. First, and principally, in the power of Christ, which is sufficient for the salvation of the whole human race. And secondly, in free will. Unquote. So, the fact that the council quotes St. Thomas here, who gives a rather narrow sense, I think, in which uh, the unbaptized can have some relationship to the church, I think this rules out an interpretation of the council which would have it that... Uh, the unbaptized are somehow in the church by some implicit desire or something along those lines. It maintains the dogmatic certainty that they are not to be constituted as members of the church, and uh, so for as long as they remain outside the church, they cannot be considered saved, which is uh, which this document, I think, affirms explicitly in Lumen Gentium 18. Now, as to the following sentences which pertain to the Jews, I'll be the first one to admit that this one is a bit tricky. <laughs> and uh, I certainly won't endorse the overly amicable tone of its expression, but as to its contents, we should analyze this piece by piece. Uh, for one, can it be said in any sense that the Jews, even after rejecting the New Covenant, remain particularly dear to God? Now, if by most dear... Uh, we mean this to imply that God somehow approves uh, them in their errors or waives their rejection of the Messiah simply because of their claim to the Old Covenant. Well, then certainly not. But are we restricted that, to that interpretation? Now, I wouldn't say so. And this is because there is indeed a very important sense in which it is true that the Old Covenant has not been revoked in that God's initiative in establishing uh, the first uh, kahal, or, or, or people of God, uh, that still remains in force. But the advent of Christ brought this uh, kahal, or, or people of God, um, to consummation in the church. But it is the same entity. So as such, the Jews who descend from this primordial people of God by virtue of their, uh, of their ancestral lineage are in a particular way called to realize the perfective fulfillment of this ancestral lineage that God had uh, established through Christ. And so as long as they stem from this ancestral lineage, they are not only called to accept Christ as universal Lord, but also as the fulfillment of this original people of God, from whom even now they still descend, uh, not as God's faithful people, but as estranged descendants of that faithful people and as estranged descendants they are called uh, to honor this lineage by accepting its perfective fulfillment that God has established in the person of Christ they cannot shake off the fact that they uh, descend from that ancestral line that was created specifically to usher in the coming of Christ according to the flesh uh, so uh, far from affirming their current estrangement, it calls them to renounce their way of life and bring themselves into union with the fulfillment of that original people of God, of uh, which even now they are descendants. So, uh, given the strict letter of what the text says, I, I just don't think that uh, we have to go any further than that. Um, so, to move on further a bit in the passage, the council uh, then declares, quote, But the plan of salvation also includes those who acknowledge the Creator. In the first place, among these are the Muslims, who, professing to hold the faith of Abraham, along with us adore the one and merciful God, who in the last day will judge all mankind. Now, uh, contrary to how a lot of people read uh, this passage, I actually see this as one of the easiest 
controversial passages to contend with, and here's why. Um, first and foremost, it is dogmatically certain that the plan of salvation, insofar as God has a universally salvific will, does indeed extend to everyone. Uh, now, that's something that cannot be denied on pain of contradicting the plain meaning of Scripture, uh, that God wills all to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Um, hence, the plan of salvation as something uh, to be offered must necessarily include Muslims. Uh, now, notice what it does not say. It does not say that uh, they are to be assured of the efficacious reception of salvation. Um, it says the plan of salvation, speaking to God's antecedent will here, includes the Muslims, just as it would include anyone. Um, and indeed, the Muslims, uh, their claim to be descendants of Abraham, or, 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 or rather, to profess the faith of Abraham, uh, it does indeed place them in a unique relationship set apart from non-Abrahamic sects, uh, insofar as their acceptance of the Old Testament scriptures uh, implies an engagement with a possession that is properly the church's. Now, they distort this possession, obviously, and they refuse to commune with its true owner. But again, this relationship should intensify our desire to convert them, uh, and, and bring them into a proper union with the true owner of these sacred texts and ultimately its divine author. Um, speaking of this divine author, the, te the, the council, in declaring that they together with us adore the one and merciful God, uh, should likewise cause us no concern because uh, it does not imply that they render proper or meritorious adoration of him, only that they acknowledge the one God as creator of the cosmos. Now, if it is objected that their rejection of the Trinity, say, makes it incoherent to state that this is the same God, I would agree and disagree, but in different respects. So, in the first respect, uh, of course, it is true that their rejection of the Trinity does contradict key truths about God's interior life, and therefore, insofar as they reject this doctrine, uh, they fall short of engaging with God. But, insofar as they acknowledge, say, a unitary source of all things, uh, then they must be referring to the one and only divine being, who in his interior life, of course, is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, let's give an analogy. Let's say I see a shadowy figure walking down uh, the street at night, and I presume the shadowy figure to be a man, but it's actually a woman. Uh, now, if I point to this figure and say, uh, gee, I wonder who uh, he is, Am I truly referring to the actual entity, even though I would obviously be gravely mistaken about her identity? Well, of course. But insofar as I hold to this error, I would not be. Yet, insofar as I recognize the existence of the figure, uh, of course I would be referring to the same entity. Uh, so, when Muslims engage in worship of the one God as source of all being, insofar as they recognize him as creator, they are indeed rendering unto him worship. Now the question of course becomes, is it proper or improper worship? Well clearly it's improper, and so we cannot say that their worship is meritorious, even though they may indeed recognize key truths about him, such as his mercy, such as uh, his, his, his unity, such as his wisdom, or, or, or what have you. Um, and again, I don't think we have to go any further than uh, interpreting the strict letter of the council's texts here. And as I said before, I think uh, the more we insist that there is some indirect relationship they bear to the church, as I will go uh, into more later on, um, this should only intensify our desire to, conf uh, to convert them. It should not lessen it. Um, so within the broader car uh, category of the unbaptized, the council also singles out uh, non-Abrahamic religious traditions when it says, quote, nor is God far distant from those who, in shadows and images, seek the unknown God. For it is he who gives to all men life and breath and all things, and as Savior wills that all men be saved. Uh, those also can attain salvation who, through no fault of their own, do not know the gospel of Christ and his church, yet sincerely seek God and, moved by grace, strive by their deeds to do his will as it is known to them through the dictates of conscience. 
Nor does divine providence deny the helps necessary for salvation to those who, without blame on their part, have not yet arrived at an explicit knowledge of God, and, with his grace, strive to live a good life. Whatever good or truth is found among them is looked upon by the church as a preparation for the gospel. She knows that it is given by him who enlightens all men so that uh, they may finally have life. Unquote. Uh, now before we go into explicating this passage, we should first, right off the bat, state a couple of uh, preconciliar parallels which state more or less the same thing, but perhaps expressed in a manner that has the benefit of greater clarity and nuance. Uh, first and perhaps most importantly, I think, for our purposes certainly, since uh, this pope in many ways defines anti-liberal Catholicism, um, we have Pius IX, who uh, in his encyclical Quanto uh, Confitiamor Morore says, quote, we know, as well as you, that those who suffer from invincible ignorance with regard to our most holy religion, by carefully keeping the natural law and its precepts, which have been written by God in the hearts of all, by being disposed to obey God and to lead a virtuous and correct life, can, by the power of divine light and grace, attain eternal life. For God, who sees, examines, and knows completely the minds and souls, thoughts and qualities of all, will not permit, in his infinite goodness and mercy, anyone who is not guilty of a voluntary fault to suffer eternal punishment." Unquote. Now as you can see here, this mirrors, mirrors very closely, almost word for word actually, in some parts, the conciliar statement in Lumen Gentium, in that it acknowledges the possibility of someone who labors under invincible ignorance to be saved by the help of grace outside the visible walls of the church. Uh, secondly, we have uh, Gary Lagrange, who uh, in many ways, I'm sure a lot of you know, is considered the arch opponent to the uh, Nouvelle Theologie, a fierce enemy of modernism. Uh, and he says in his book, Life Everlasting, quote, Among non-Christians, there are souls which are elect. Jews and Mohammedans not only uh, admit monotheism, but retain fragments of primitive revelation. They believe in a God who is supernatural, uh, who is rather a supernatural rewarder, and thus, with the aid of grace, can make him an act of contrition. And even to pagans who live in invincible and voluntary ignorance of the true religion and who will uh, and who still attempt to observe the natural law supernatural aids are offered by means known only to god these as pius the ninth says can arrive at salvation god never commands the impossible to him who does what is in his power god does not refuse grace Unquote. Now, right off the bat, I think I should say that even I would take issue, minor issue, with him stating that it is known uh, for a fact that there are elect souls in this category, because I think uh, that's just outside the competency for a man to know. But uh, the fundamental point of what he's saying, I think, remains essentially indistinguishable from the substance of what the Council teaches on this matter, and that is, since by nature all men yearn for the supernatural elevation to become partakers of the divine nature. God wills to provide this elevation to all of humanity. And so uh, it would be unjust if uh, some factor outside of one's competency were to rob him of that supernatural elevation. As Gary Lagrange says, echoing Pius IX, God does not commit the impossible and will not permit souls to perish outside the realm of what they have knowingly and deliberately willed. Uh, but this is not to say that this constitutes an exception to the dogma that there is no salvation outside the church. Quite to the contrary. If such invincible ignorant souls, uh, invincibly ignorant rather, souls are saved, then they are saved through the grace dispensed from God, uh, through the mystical body of Christ, who uh, alone is the one who grants salvation and uh, obviously uh, this extra sacramental grace would would have to be such as to bestow the grace of baptism in order uh, for them to be admitted into the kingdom because baptism the grace of baptism rather uh, is is absolutely speaking necessary for uh, salvation but whatever grace is bestowed if it brings salvation to them, it would have to be of such a character as to incorporate them into the mystical body of Christ prior to the separation of the soul from the body. 
the uncertainty of this therefore uh, ensures that we do not adopt a complacent attitude uh, in the way of evangelization for even if someone uh, who does labor under invincible ignorance uh, of the true religion um, e even if uh, their their ignorance of the true religion does not uh, hold them condemned uh, nevertheless human concupiscence tells us that there are a myriad of other violations of the natural law which they would obviously be prone to as we all are uh, just as, as, as one example um, so all in all given the obvious continuity here between preconciliar arch enemies of modernism and uh, this passage from Lumen Gentium as well as the nuances just discussed I don't think this passage as strictly written would constitute uh, even the level of a doctrinal error let alone a heresy now I think it is important at this point to understand that while the council is clearly expressing these things uh, for the sake of uh, ecumenical amicability uh, I would actually argue that, if anything, the premise that there are souls outside the visible walls of the church that remain linked or related to her in some way, far from fostering a spirit of religious indifferentism, should actually embolden and intensify the desire to bring such souls into proper communion with the church, uh, that they are already here and now called to commune with in a special way by virtue of precisely the manner in which they are related to her outside her visible walls. Um, in a sense, particularly for baptized non-Catholics, insofar as they are related to the church, in that measure, uh, the church claims them as her own in a way. And uh, for that reason, the impulse to bring them into harmonious unity with the church should be intensified and even more rigorously pursued. Uh, and I would cite uh, the parable of the lost sheep to bolster that point. Um, so if anything, I would actually uh, make use of the principles called, uh, spelled out here in Lumen Gentium to strengthen the case for proselytizing, say, Protestants and schismatics. Um, it is true, as per Bellarmine, if they have put themselves into a state of heresy or schism by willful deliberation, then obviously they cannot be considered formal members of the church. But they are still nonetheless, as Bellarmine admits, they still do retain some relation to her, and that relation should serve as a basis for doing everything in our power to bring them back into proper union with the church that they are called to return to by virtue of their baptism, which does retain the indelible mark on their soul. Now, as to the non-baptized, uh, the fact that even they bear some obscure relation to the church, as we just got done clarifying, this should likewise only intensify our zeal to incorporate them into the mystical body of the incarnate word, because their very nature yearns for its supernatural elevation by grace to become partakers of the divine nature. So far from weakening our zeal to convert, uh, to convert them, the presence of some relation to the church, even extending to the non-baptized, should only intensify it. So I hope this video was uh, helpful to you. If you'd like to give it a thumbs up, if you disagreed or, or have concerns or just additional insights, just let me know in the comments. Um, just a reminder, uh, my Patreon has indeed been online for a week now. Again, uh, just to reiterate, uh, for $5, you'll get monthly book recommendations, all audio files to my videos, voting privileges for topics of certain videos, and, and of course the Q&A priority. Uh, and for ten dollars you get all of that plus a guaranteed commitment to do a video on a topic of your choice uh, just so long as it pertains to uh, philosophy and theology so uh, if you're interested in that you know go ahead and sign up uh, uh, and and i'll put the link to that of course in the description uh, god bless